All righty. This looks nice. This looks nice. So happy Thursday. Happy Thursday. Um, I am excited to be back. I hope everyone had a wonderful holiday. Um, and I'm excited to continue back with our blogs and, and with these live sessions. I love coming up on these live sessions and chatting. Um, before we get into it really quick, if you haven't checked out my new ebook, How to Get World Class Sleep, it's out. It talks a lot about circadian health, circadian rhythm, light rhythms, um, and, and a lot of best practices that I share with all my clients and patients. So you will have access to all. So you can check that out. Um, if you haven't checked out my video on high blood pressure and talking about how to reverse it naturally, you can do that too. It's free. So with that out of the way, um, yeah, let's just get right into this because We've been talking so much about mitochondria and light and water and not as much magnetism, although that kind of like comes into a lot of this. But what we need to start relating it to is, you know, we're not individual beings. I think we, we get caught up in that. But what I've talked about in the past and, and uh, of course, I, I think is very obvious. And if you just look out to nature, nature's fractal. So in other words, they're all systems that are the same. They just operate at different scales. What I mean by that is this. We have roughly 40 trillion human cells inside of us. We got over 100 trillion different bacteria and fungi and other microbes inside of us that collectively, by the way, make up anywhere between two and a half and like six pounds of our body weight is just microbes. So it, it makes more sense to call us super organisms than individual human beings, because we are actually, in some ways, run and dictated by the microbiome inside of us, which is either kind of scary or really freaking cool, depending on where you stand on that. And just to give you a perspective of like how exciting and important this is. So with the concept of, of Watson and Crick bringing on, you know, the discovery of DNA. And then basically we've spent the past 70 years worrying about genes being a problem when it comes to our health. We have to remember that the, the human genome is roughly made up of like 20,000 or so genes that makes up our DNA sequence. Now I've used this analogy before, but consider the fact that the flea on your dog, maybe, hopefully not, but maybe your dog has a flea on it. That flea has about 50% more genes than us. So we take it like this concept of like, oh, like we're the most genetically complex and all this. And that's not true at all. Well, I'll take that a step further. 99% of the DNA inside of our body is not even human. It's microbial. It's bacterial. So it's more, this is why it's, it's, it's so much more correct to say that we aren't even individual human beings we are walking talking ecosystems and the the more we start treating ourselves like walking talking ecosystems the better we're going to be because we have to understand we need to live in concert with our environment now each of us you and i both have uh unique microbiome similar to it's like a microbial fingerprint if you will and it actually has its own brain and it communicates with us. Now, some people will call this the second brain and, what, and it's connected to our nervous system via what we call the vagus nerve. And this is a cranial nerve that connects to well, all of our internal organs. Most of that, though, is going to go to the gut. And believe it or not, 90% of the fibers that go in between the brain and the gut, 90% of them are bringing information from the gut to the brain. So we spend nine, 90% of that information is going to the brain to give us a, a, an idea of what's going on in that external ecosystem. Yeah, the vagus nerve. And it actually operates independently from the brain in your own head, but it could be influenced by, or more importantly, it influences our brain. Because remember, 90% of those fibers are sensory. They're going to the brain. They're going up. They're not going down. Also interesting note that the, 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 this enteric nervous system, the second brain, the, the gut microbiome, it actually uses 30 plus neurotransmitters, which is the same thing that happens in our own brain. 
it produces 95% of the body's serotonin. And about 50% of the dopamine is in the bowels. So we have neurotransmitters. We have, uh, you know, information about inflammation, about energy metabolism, about satiety or hunger, all going to the brain. Um, and it's going to be influenced by the vagus nerve or that or those connections. It's going to be influenced by our nutrition. It's going to be influenced by the health of the gut. And it's really important that we understand this because when we start, again, looking at ourselves as larger ecosystems as part of a whole, I think we begin to looking at we, we begin to look at this a lot differently. Now, to, to look at some of this, there's actually been um, some really interesting research on the gut and, and how it can impact our mood and tendencies. And this is why I think it's really important when we talk about uh, mental health, light exposure, all of this stuff is, is connected. So there are some studies back in like the early 2010s. And there was one they called the force swimming experiment, which is pretty brutal, but let me explain it. They took mice and basically they, they put them in a, in a pool with edges that were too high for them to climb out of. And they, they, they timed how long these mice would swim until they would give up. And what they found was that mice that were depressed did not swim as long as ones that did not and, or who, who were not depressed. Um, and this is actually some a, a, a test they used to for uh, introduction trials for antidepressant drugs, believe it or not, because if they could get the mice to swim longer, they would that that might be a sign that the drug is working. Similar studies actually decided to take it the next step because the gut microbiome was becoming more popular. It, that there was there was more evidence showing that there might be a, a link between it and uh, mental health. And what they found was instead of using a drug, they actually injected mice with a certain type of probiotic bacteria called Lactobacillus rhamnosus. Now, you don't need to know the strain necessarily, but what you need to know is it's a probiotic strain. And in 2011, this was like a pretty novel idea. And what they found were that the mice who were just injected with this probiotic strain actually were more motivated and swam longer than the mice that were not. So in other words, like instead of using a drug, like an antidepressant, they just added microbes to this gut's internal environment and were able to increase the ability for it to, to swim for longer and keep it motivated to swim longer. And on top of that, they found the mice with the improved gut flora also had less circulating stress hormones uh, in their bloodstream, better performance in memory, and improved learning. So just by reshaping the gut, the, the, the different species in that gut environment, these scientists found that it had profound impacts on their mental health. And this brings us to back to light and photosynthesis, because when I think a lot of folks in this space, like we tend to talk about energy in this sort of like esoteric or etheric connotation, but like really, like if you've been following along for the past couple of months, like what energy really is, is solar power. We're talking about sun energy, literally powering everything on this planet. And that's why we started this series way back when on photosynthesis, because photosynthesis is what allows all life beyond it to continue to grow and, and, and do well on this planet. Now, we've talked about photosynthesis in the past, so I'm not going to go over it too much. But what we want, I want to talk a little bit about today is the chlorophylls themselves. Now, generally speaking, there are six types of chlorophyll. Uh, nature primarily uses two. Those are known as chlorophyll A and B. And what we find is that they absorb all different colors of light except green, which is why plants show up as green. That's why their leaves are green. Uh, now, there's different types absorb different wavelengths. So, for example, chlorophyll A absorbs more in the violet spectrum and in the orange spectrum. Chlorophyll B is going to absorb more yellow light and more blue light. Um, 
And and the differences in these, believe it or not, they actually look molecularly, molecularly, almost exactly the same, with the exception of one methyl group being changed for an aldehyde group, which is a CHO, if you want to go back to chemistry. But they look the same, and, and I'll include this in, in the blog this week, but they they are they are a, a set of a series of compounds known as porphyrins and porphyrins create these ring like structures and i've shared this in previous blogs in the past but the two primary porphyrins that we talk about in nature are chlorophyll and the other's hemoglobin and the only difference really between the two is that in plants magnesium is the center ion in this ring and in in uh hemoglobin it's iron, and that's what gives it the red hue. That's what makes blood red. It's this. It's the iron found in heme, which is found in hemoglobin. And that is ultimately the major difference between the two. It is just a switching of one atom. And, and I think appreciating that is, is, I think, really important because when we're talking about us being electrical beings and the gut is part of that too, it's really, really important to kind of Keep that in mind. What's also interesting is that porphyrins are actually known to have semiconductive properties. Now, if you've been following along, we now know through Gerald Pollack's work, through um, some other people's work like uh, Robert Becker, that we have semiconductive properties in the body. And in other words, we can transfer electrons from place to place virtually instantaneously at the speed of light, which is much faster the nerves can do now and what we find is these porphyrin ring structures work as ways to transfer and transmit light energy yeah so in plants what they do is they use these chlorophylls these porphyrin rings they take co2 and water from the environment and they transform it into oxygen and carbohydrates now we have mitochondria that basically reverse this process and this is why I've spent so many weeks hammering this home. Mitochondria break down these carbohydrates and fats into acetyl-CoA. These get released in uh, uh, release energy in the form of electrons. And this is why, if you've been around here a while, like I really am not big about talking about macros in general. Because when you look at it, if you actually look at the biochemistry pathways whether it's a fatty acid or a glucose, which by the way, all carbohydrates and all fatty acids have to get broken down into if they want to be absorbed, they both end up at the same constituent, which is acetyl-CoA, to power the electric cycle, which we call oxidative phosphorylation or the electron transport chain. They both end up as acetyl-CoA. One does it through glycolysis, one does it through a process known as beta oxidation, but the end product of both is acetyl-CoA. And this is why we need to start focusing on the electrons and not how many fats am I having? How many carbohydrates am I having? How many proteins am I having? None of them enter the bloodstream as is anyway. You can only absorb them as glucose or simple sugars, fatty acids, or amino acids. So we need to come back to this idea, this vitalistic idea that we are actually electrical beings. We are not separate from that. And this acetyl-CoA now enters the Krebs cycle uh, and undergoes cellular respiration. Now, NAD and FAD, uh, FAD+, plus, they're going to pick up these electrons and form NADH and FADH2. These bring these electrons to the electron transport chain. They pump out the protons and use the electrons. What is the ultimate acceptor of these? It's oxygen, and that creates water. And if you've been around here for a while, you know that Water is the more important product of this, even more so than ATP, because all ATP does is it allows for proteins to change their shape so that water can come in its liquid crystal form and act as a semiconductor to send light energy in the form of electrons all over the body. That is what is actually happening. That is how most of the energy is transmitted in the body. This is how we are light beings. Now, why do I say that? Our cells are loaded with mitochondria. Now, if you look at, you know, the biology textbook maybe you had in high school or I had in high school, 
cells look like a bag of water with maybe some floating organelles. You might see an endoplasmic reticulum. You might see some ribosomes. Uh, you might see like one or two of mitochondria, but that's not actually what cells look like. Cells in general take up, or sorry, mitochondria in cells take up as much as 25% of the cell volume. And on average, cells contain anywhere between 1,000 and 2,500 mitochondria per cell. All of these are generating electricity using electrons. And what's even more interesting is that mitochondria are really efficient at emitting light. Now, this is kind of wild, and this is where we're going to start talking about this today. So this is what this is really a story about. It's not about fats. It's not about carbohydrates. It's not about proteins. It's about electrons, and it's about light. And we actually create internal light, and that is what we're talking about today. So cells in general in the human body, it's estimated that we have – ultimately 100,000 tasks per second that need to be done. Uh, the circadian rhythm is actually primarily responsible for coord the coordination of these tasks. And even things like mitosis cycle, so that cell division, is largely regulated by circadian rhythm. This is why if you take, and they've done these studies where they've put rats and hamsters, et cetera, in Faraday cages, they actually lose their circadian rhythm and you'll see their sleep cycles change and their health deteriorate very quickly. But as soon as they're exposed, not even to light, but just the Schumann resonance, that they will regain their normal circadian rhythms again, which is pretty cool. So unnatural light in this will negatively affect these cellular rhythms. And again, it's not just going to be us, it's going to affect our mitochondria as well. Now, why does this matter? If you remember what you learned back in high school, because we all learned it, is that mitochondria at some point were prokaryotes. In other words, they were individual cells on their own. And at some point, eukaryotes, like us, like mammals, like other animals that have more than one cell, they were somehow absorbed into them and they became essentially the electric generators, if you will. That's why you hear mitochondria. They're called the powerhouses of the cell. The biggest cliche probably in biology um, is that. Now, what we haven't been able to realize until more recently is how we are actually light beings. And I mentioned earlier around the time of... Uh, who was it? Oh, man, I'm going to lose the name. Um, Volta. Yes, when we come out with the battery, there was this concept of uh, vitalism, that humans were actually electric beings, and there was this other concept uh, that we were more mechanistic. We were not electric. And I think now that idea of humans being electrical beings is coming back more into vogue because there's no other way to explain a lot of these things that we've talked about. That's why we talked about semiconduction and Dr. Becker's work a few weeks ago, because it just cannot explain how fast a lot of these things get done in the body. Now, a lot of this work we're going to talk about is actually due to a man, Dr. Fritz Albert Popp, who is a German doctor, um, researcher, really, uh, mostly in the 70s. And he coined the term biophotons, or what he referred to as ultra-weak photonic emissions that are emitted by cells. And he found that biophotons contain important information that can impact all body processes. And these biophotons can provide order and regulation. Now, biophotonics itself is part of quantum biology. Um, and it, it, what it does is it, it explores the interaction between single photons. And photons are just light energy, light particles, although they're really not particles. They're more waves, wave particles, if you will. Um, and their interaction. And what he found, and, and the ultra weak, by the way, is we're talking very low amounts of, of bio photons, anywhere between one and a hundred photons per second per centimeter squared of coherent photons are, can be found in living systems and actually have biological effects. So he found that cells not only emit light, and this is primary, primarily through the electron tra transport chain, which is why mitochondria are so important, but they also absorb light. 
And biophotons that are emitted from free radicals during uh, can also be emitted during cellular stress. So part of the electron transport chain, part of this is actually creates reactive oxygen species. Now, if you were back when we were talking about the sun and melatonin, most melatonin in the body is actually created in mitochondria. And it's, it's what initiates that is infrared light exposure. So melatonin in a lot of ways can be a hormone of daylight. Why? Because this, the melatonin is made in mitochondria to essentially put out the fire of reactive oxygen species so that it's, we, don't, we aren't overwhelmed by it. Now, reactive oxygen species, as we've talked about in the past, aren't necessarily bad on their own. When there's too many, it becomes a problem. We're going to come back to that. Now, what is important with this light part and why we're talking about biophotons is I mentioned earlier that cells are, are doing roughly 100,000 tasks per minute or per second, I should say, in the body. That's a lot going on. Now, if you've taken biochemistry or organic chemistry, we still have kind of this idea of this billiard ball or, or lock and key model where we have molecules just kind of floating around in water. And, you know, if they happen to fit in, in the right place, then, then a reaction will take place. And there's this element of randomness. Now, this is why some people who use orthomolecular supplementation or drugs, this is like hitting the, the, the control alt delete button on your computer. You're, you could force quit or force a procedure to happen by just overrunning it. However, people like Pop and some Russian researchers actually had some other ideas. They, they, they didn't, the, the concept of, of randomly floating molecules just waiting for something to bump into each other for a reaction to occur didn't necessarily make sense to them. And they wanted to know, like, is there a way that these molecules can communicate so that these reactions can happen in a more efficient manner? In other words, like it can't just happen by random chance. If, if there are a hundred thousand reactions happening every second, like just just the, the math didn't work out from a physics standpoint. So, what they found, and this is where again the work of of Becker comes in, because when you find that bone, for example, can be a semiconductor, and and then take that a step further, any hydrophilic surface that is touched by water can make a gel-like exclusion zone that acts as a liquid crystal semiconductor can be a, a, a communication, a, a mode of a, a communication in the body. And what they found was that maybe it was emitting these ultra weak bio photons that allowed for communication between cells so that things can go to the right areas at the right time. So, what Pop was finding is that the, these bio, these biophoton emissions, they were originating from the relaxation of electronically excited states. So what happens with photons is you have an electron, say, in a valence ring. You have light come in, a photon come in. It hits an electron. It gets bounced up to the next energy state. And when it comes back down to its resting after it's done being excited, we call it it emits another photon out and that is what creates these that 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 biophoton emission that photon emission it's light coming in interacting with an electron and then that electron releasing energy to continue to somewhere else and this is and this is partially what reactive oxygen species are in mitochondria when they are created through the electron transport chain and they actually generate these reactive oxygen species, which play a lot of roles, including cell signaling and healthy immune responses and cellular adaptation. Why? Because these emissions of light actually talk with cells around it, telling each other what to do. So, so light, in a lot of ways, is the communication system inside our body. Even though we can't see it, because a lot of these are in the UV spectrum, so they're invisible to us. And, and we're going to get to that. I know I'm kind of jumping ahead here, but that is effectively what is going on. These biophoton emissions are, are the continuous and spontaneous emission of light from all biological systems, including humans, including mitochondria, including bacteria. And 
they're found in mostly the UV part of the spectrum at ultra low intensities. This is what Pop was finding in his research, is that all things were emitting light at the cellular level, even down at the mitochondrial level, and he wanted to know why. Now, where does Becker's work come into this? Now, believe it or not, early on, NASA, believe it or not, of all places, was, was really interested in light and healing. And the reason for this, and if you read the body electric, you'll actually see this, is Becker was fascinated by Russian astronauts that were being sent out into space. When they came back, they seemed to age faster. Their connective tissue would break. Um, and, and it was measured that wounds would heal slower, bones would atrophy. And these were at rates 19 times faster than people who were on Earth. He wanted to know why. And NASA actually at the time was using LED lights in different spectrums to help treat wounds and, and, and astronauts while they were in space. From, from mitigating some of the detrimental effects of being in space. So that was something, and this is something that Fritz Pop actually was fascinated by. And what he found, he was analyzing various different chemicals and he found ones that scrambled light at 380 nanometers, which by the way is UVA. It's like on the border of violet and UV, um, and violet and ultraviolet. Um, if they scrambled light, those tended to be chemicals that were carcinogens. But if the if those chemicals allowed 380 nanometer light to, to come through, to pass through, they weren't problems. And in fact, they would help heal the body. And this is something that like kind of, that was kind of wild to pop was his next experiment. So he did experiments where he would actually kill bacteria with UV light. Again, 380 nanometer light and up to 99%, say, of a population, say, in a Petri dish. And what he found was when he used that same 380 nanometer UV light, but at a much lower intensity, he could entirely repair the microbes and build them back to where they were within a day. Now, to this day, scientists don't necessarily understand this phenomenon fully, but what they call it is photo repair. Um, he found, for example, that patients he saw with uh, zero derma pigmentosum, which is a type of um, a skin ailment that could potentially lead to skin cancer. Um, these people had issues because they could not photo repair the solar damage that they had. And but what struck him was that the same light that was healing was also harming. It was just a matter of intensity that was different. And he also found that if the light was blocked in the body, if it was scrambled, cancer tends to follow. Because remember what he found was that if the light was scrambled in the body, it tended to be a carcinogen. And this was something that really interested, interested him. So the cells inside our body and the microbes inside of us actually create UV light. Now, a quick refresher on this. Now we have the, the solar radiation is technically broken up into three main categories. We have ultraviolet, we have visible light, we have infrared. Infrared is the longest wavelength. UV is the shortest. It's the highest frequency. UV radiation is further broken down into three subcategories. We have UVA, which is long ultraviolet, usually 380 to 320 nanometers. We have UVB, which is what most people will tell you gives you skin cancer, uh, which is 280 to 320. I've talked about that in depth if you want to go read blogs on that. And then short which is UVC, 100 to 280 nanometers. Now, UVC light doesn't even really reach the Earth's surface. It's all blocked by the ionosphere. A small percentage of UVB gets through, and most of the most of the UV radiation that reaches the Earth's surface is actually UVA. So those are the three kind of big ones that, that kind of come through here. Now, how does this all matter to the gut? Like, this is all great. Now, if you don't know, the gut lining inside of us actually regenerates itself every two to five days. And the gut lining and the microbes inside of it are reliant on our day-night cycles. So what does this mean? Is if, if you're a circadian mismatch, if you're staying up way late at night and exposed to artificial lights, you're actually impairing your gut's ability to heal. 
this is really important if you maybe were diagnosed with SIBO or inflammatory bowel disease or IBS and you're in front of all these lights at night, literally changing your light environment, getting light on your skin, resetting your circadian rhythm is going to be an important part of your healing process with this. Because cell division, which is necessary for repairing something, say like leaky gut, takes place at night in the absence of light. When we sleep, that's rest detox repair. That's when most of this stuff happens. This is why circadian rhythms, getting in rhythm is so important. Now, here's something wild that came out in 2019, and I'm surprised I haven't heard more people talk about this, and it's probably because people love supplementing with vitamin D. So there was some, there was a few researchers from Canada, and I'm just going to read this because this is wild. Um, they What they did was they found – I'll give you the punchline, and then I'll go through what it was. They found that UVB light alone can lead to shifts in the microbiome and incre it increase – microbial diversity, especially in people with low levels of vitamin D. And I've talked about this in, vi in the past. Vitamin D, A, is a hormone. B, is just a surrogate for sunlight exposure. And they were able to do this not with vitamin D supplementation, with light exposure. UVB light exposure improved their gut diversity alone. Did not change diet. I want to say that again. Did not change diet. It was just changing the light environment, changed the gut environment. That should blow your mind because it blew mine, not because it blew mine, but it did blow mine. But because how many of us listen to folks on the internet, including myself, who are saying like, we got to do this, we got to do that and ignore this or don't take it seriously, or it's not at the forefront of what we're teaching folks. When it's literally just like, hey, going outside, getting UVB exposure literally changes your gut microbiome. I'm going to read a quote from this. And what's interesting, by the way, so they actually broke the, the they found an interesting trend before I get into that. Is they broke the groups up into uh, people who were supplementing with vitamin D and people who were not supplementing with vitamin D. And this is something that I've been thinking about for a while because remember vitamin d is not a vitamin it's a hormone and we should not be we should not be taking things in, in an ideal world that the body makes on its own one of which is vitamin d i had someone ask me what's the best food source of vitamin d it's the sun it's right outside um but with that what they found was the folks who supplemented with vitamin d did not see an improvement in microbial diversity and so in some cases, it got worse. It was only in the folks who were not supplementing with vitamin D got the benefit. So I want to read this. This, this. I have a few quotes from the study here and right, from the author. So this is the first study to show that humans with low vitamin D serum levels uh, display overt changes in their intestinal microbiome in response to uh, UVB skin exposure and increases in vitamin D levels, suggesting the existence of a novel skin-gut axis that could promote intestinal homeostasis and health. Another quote, we found that vitamin D production was the main driver of the shift of the microbiome. It is well known that UVB light produces vitamin D, and we are now starting to understand that vitamin D is important in maintaining a healthy gut. Although those facts were known separately, this is the first study that links them in humans. The results are important as there were, was a strong vis effect visible within the span of a week. They were able to change the microbiome diversity in the guts of people with low vitamin D with UVB light exposure in a week. Another author on the paper, Bruce Valance, here's a quote. The results of this study have implications for people who are undergoing UVB phototherapy and identify and identifies a novel skin gut axis that may contribute to the protective role of UVB light exposure in inflammatory diseases like MS and IBD, MS multiple sclerosis, IBD, inflammatory bowel disease. I'm 
I know that sounds far-fetched. And I know, I know no one else on the internet is talking about this more or less because this is independent of food decisions. This should be really exciting because some of the answers are super simple. Some of this stuff might sound complicated, but the truth is nature is really simple. We tend to complicate things as human beings. So moving back to shifting back to Fritz Pop here. So what he was able to find through more research is that using photomultipliers, which now came about in the 1970s, he was able to find that cucumber seedlings, potato seedlings, they would actually emit more light when they were germinated and they started growing. And what he concluded was that when we eat plant foods, we take up the photons and store them. This is another reason why when I keep talking about this, we need to stop focusing on carbohydrates, proteins, fats. We need to start talking about electrons, photons, and light because that's what's happening. The sun is bringing light, photons to the earth. These plants are taking up that sunlight and literally creating carbohydrates, which is effectively just light energy. And we consume that. So we consume light energy through, from the sun. We consume light energy from plants. This is so important. And this is also why it's this, this transference of photons and electrons. And this is why when you take in these photons, the body disperses their energy. These photons encompass the entire electromagnetic spe spectrum from lowest to highest. And this energy is the driving force for molecules in the body. It's this energy. It's not ATP. It is the energy given from light. This was, it is the electrons that, that are part of this that actually are the driving force of energy in the body. Now the gut is designed to process food. And if it processes food, that means it must be able to work with light. And we've seen damaged cells tend to, and this is something that Pop found, damaged cells emit more light than healthy cells. This is why having reactive oxygen species in the right amount is actually really helpful because it serves as cell signaling. It serves as a cell signaling molecule to say, hey, we need some repair, we need antioxidants, et cetera, et cetera. This is actually what reactive oxygen species too. This is that UV light emission that you get from mitochondria or from when there's an injury, when you cut your hand, when there's some sort of inflammation, you're gonna get a greater emission of biophotons. And this is what Fritz Pop actually found is he took healthy leaves and he took damaged leaves and what he found was that the leaves that were more damaged, they had less chlorophyll, but gave off more biophotons. The opposite was true in, in healthy leaves. So they had more chlorophyll and less biophoton uh, emission. So what, what he found with this is, is this light emission, if we're emitting more light, that could be a sign that something might be wrong. And it's a signaling to other surrounding cells or other areas of the body that is a signal that says, hey, OK, this area needs more repair. We are able to do this at the speed of light because we have hydrophilic surfaces that have liquid crystals in the same in the form of water attached to them that allow for these light emissions, even at really low intensities, to be transmitted at the speed of light inside our body faster than nerves can do it. And this is what this is one of the things that Pop found was really important. And he thought this was how the body communicates. It's not random. Oh, these molecules are, are floating in water and hopefully the right one comes at the right time. No, there, there's a system that that triggers, hey, we need this here. And it's these light emissions that do it. Pop also found that light emissions from healthy individuals had distinct biological rhythms and they changed with day and night cycles as well as weekly and monthly patterns. And there are different studies that I'll actually share in this week's blog. You can check it out that show 
cortisol levels were lower when rhythmic patterns emerged. So when there were rhythmic patterns. So when the photon emissions were more consistent and higher, cortisol levels were lower. So it was this kind of opposite relationship that 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 was there, which I thought was pretty fascinating. Um, so so there's that. And he ultimately found that healthy cells, because there were patterns of, of this light emission, it wasn't just one thing. He found that there were biological intervals at not only day to day, but every seven days, every 14 days, every 32 days, every 80 days, every 270 days that there was a synchronization between humans and the earth, the Schumann resonance, the earth's rhythms, the earth's heartbeat. And what he found was that healthy cells had a coherence with these earth's, rhythm, earth's rhythms, but cancerous and what we call autoimmune cells were, were, were not connected. They were disconnected from that. This is why light exposure is so important, why grounding is so important. It's this incoherence that, that, that's a problem. Now, there was another scientist, a Russian scientist in the 1970s, and I have his name. It's going to be in the blog, but I cannot pronounce it, so I'm not going to butcher it right now. Um, but he found that dying cells can actually transfer death emissions, if you will, to healthy cells through a quartz window, but not a modern glass one. Now, why is this important? Because glass, modern glass, reflects UV light, a lot of infrared light. So we're not, and, and this is done under the guise of, of energy efficiency, quartz does not allow that. So you will actually get full spectrum light through quartz. So he found that emissions, UV photon emissions, can penetrate through, through quartz, affecting cells in a completely different cell culture, but not through a glass one. So in other words, these photons from, from different cells in different areas, in different cultures, can communicate even though they're physically separated from each other. And this is only done through UV photon emissions. This means that cells are talking to each other using low intensity light biophotons. And it's not just our cells, it's the gut microbiomes too. And you don't need a lot. This is the concept behind nonlinear optics that I've talked about in the past is you, small inputs can lead to large outputs. It's not linear. Like if you look at a graph, you'd see a straight line. You're going to see more of that U-shaped curve going straight up. It could be exponential. So you don't need a lot of light to do it. This is why when he's calling them ultra weak, stronger, stronger emissions of that same light he found were actually antibacterial, antimicrobial. We actually know that. So you, but at weak, at lower power emissions, it can actually be healing. It can stimulate that healing response. That is what reactive oxygen species do in the body. That is how they communicate. It blew my mind too the first time that I learned this. And I genuinely mean this. There are very few things that actually blew my mind that blow my mind on a regular basis. But these concepts of, of humans being electrical beings, that there are scientists that are mocked and shamed that do this great work. And just because it doesn't fit the conventional paradigm, it doesn't get picked up. But there's so much out there that we don't know as a collective, but it's super exciting and it answers a lot of questions. The problem is a lot of doctors, including me, are not taught things like physics. And a lot of this stuff is quantum physics and generally physics related. Yes, we take it, you know, as, as, a, as a prereq, but we don't learn physics. It's biology and it's mostly chemistry. But a lot of this stuff is happening at the physics, at the electrical level. And I've personally learned this, a lot of this, by talking with people in the engineering space, in the electrical engineering space. Or, or, or something in the physics space, because these are not things that we learn. And, and if this sounds esoteric, like, I don't mean for this to be like a shameless plug, but like, check out this series I've done on the, on the blog, talking about your body being amazing, because we build this from the ground up to this point. And 
there's a lot of books that I recommend throughout it. There's a lot of, I think, really neat resources to give you a different idea and understand that we actually are electrical beings. And so is our gut. So the microbes, as we know, most of the microbes in our body are found in our colon, but they really can be throughout the digestive tract. We have an oral microbiome. We have a, a, most of it's a gut microbiome. We know that alterations in the microbiome affect fertility, affect longevity, affect our emotions, affect um, uh, how long we live, our cravings, obesity, diabetes, changes in all of this are affected by the microbiome. We know that there's differences in microbiomes in children with autism, for example, or an ability to break down things like gluten or casein. Um, we know that these are addictive too. They have opioid effects, right? So, um, you know, all of this is important. Now, what might freak you out, and this is another thing that might give you an idea of like, maybe we are, I mean, we are super organisms, but here's another idea of this. So this might sound gross, but vets for a very long time have been using a procedure which is which is just a fecal transplant now that might found, sound disgusting to you but it's a common way to repopulate altered microbiomes this is especially useful for clostridium difficile so c diff infection or c diff overgrowth is a better word for that a lot of times you know it's a opportunistic bacteria meaning it only becomes prevalent when there is when the ecosystem is not aligned for whatever reason it's not in a balanced form that's the only time where c diff is going to happen usually that's going to occur after antibiotic usage usually a lot of antibiotic usage and it could be a real problem now vets like i mentioned routinely do fecal transplants and they have over a 90% success rate um, with with C. diff overgrowths. And, and they use these for a variety of different things that are gut related and they have fantastic success. So in my opinion, it's only a matter of time before this com uh, becomes more common in humans. It does happen, these quote unquote gut, gut transplants or fecal transplants, but it's usually done as a last resort type of thing. Um, but the success rates are really good and it, believe it or not, is a generally safe procedure. Um, now, obviously, we don't want to get to that point where we maybe need that. We need ways to repopulate that ourselves. So what are some of the things that might be issues? One of the biggest ones are GMOs and unnatural foods. A lot of these, oh, there we go. I had a friend who was healed from C. diff through a fecal transplant. Exactly. That's what I'm talking about. This stuff is known. It's just not popular. And, and there are reasons for it. Because think about it. If you take a healthy ecosystem, if you take a... Let's make this as common as possible. If we take a healthy plant and put it in soil that's destroyed, that healthy plant's going to eventually die. Take the flip side. Say you take a, di a dying plant and you put this in this nutrient-rich soil that has a, a really rich microbiome and, and, and mycelium network and all of this as part of it, chances are that plant's going to regrow. And, and, and become stronger than it was because the environment allows it to happen. When you throw in GMOs, when you throw in unnatural foods, when you throw in poor light environments, when you throw in antibiotics and glyphosate and heavy metals, these are all drying out that soil. That's effectively what's happening in, in various ways or another. But what happens is when you dry out that soil, you're going to lose some of that diversity. You're going to lose some of the species along the way. And we know that the less diverse those species are, the worse someone's health tends to be. The more diverse it is, the closer you get to a thousand or even potentially above a thousand different species, the more robust one's health tends to be. That is a really interesting point here. The other interesting point when we're talking about light, particularly when the gut, Pop found through his research that prokaryotes, single-celled organisms, release a lot more light than eukaryotes. Now, they weren't able to figure out whether it was different between mitochondrial DNA and, and eukaryote, uh, uh, nuclear DNA in, in eukaryotes. I would guess that mitochondrial DNA would be higher, one, because prokaryotes 
that quote, mitochondria are thought to come from prokaryotic cells. So that would make more sense. Two is mitochondria are where most of our energy is coming from anyway. So that is why, you know, this stuff is so important. And that is why, like, consuming foods that are rich in biophotons in energy is going to be a lot more beneficial for your health. This is why I'm such a proponent for things like um, organic foods. Like, we know GMOs and pesticides are going to diminish literally the light being given off by these foods. And we consume that light, that light energy. We know sprouts, as things are growing initially, emit the most light because that's when things are changing. That's when you're getting cell division and everything's growing and things are sprouting out of the ground. You're going to get massive light emissions from that. And this is what Pop was able to find. So when you're consuming more organic foods, when you're consuming foods from more organic soils, when you're getting out in the sun, you are allowing yourselves to take in that light energy and become more light efficient all the way down at the mitochondrial level. This is also why, by the way, if say you go on vacation to like a tropical place, you might notice that you need less food, but you're also probably spending more time in the sun. So you can literally get more light energy from being in the sand, going for a swim in the ocean, grounding more, um, just being out in, in, a human's more natural environment, to be frank with you. You probably have to eat less food in a more tropical environment where human beings are likely to be than, say, further away from the equator, right? I'm in New York. Like, you might notice in the winter you tend to eat more. Why? Less sun exposure, less UVB exposure. You know, you need to get that light energy, that photonic energy somewhere else. So... What are we saying here at the end of the day to kind of wrap this up? Foods, what Pop essentially found going through a lot of these experiments, all things, all beings emit light. Our microbiomes emit light. The gut microbes inside of us emit light. The foods that generally are the healthiest were the foods that had the lowest but most coherent light intensity. So that it was of the same wavelengths, if you will. It was coherent. This is why using a healthcare model that is focused on antibiotics and aggressive methods that try to force feed these chemical reactions have side effects. Nature operates on a communal basis. It is not isolated. This is why monocrop farms, um, you know, pesticides and insecticides, um, you know, trying to isolate these things. This is not actually how our guts, how our microbes, how our bodies work. The more diverse we are, the better health we have. The opposite is also true. The less diverse we are, the less health we have. The sun at energy is stored in plants. This is why more raw fruits and vegetables is going to be a really important part for powering up those mitochondria because that is where you're going to find a lot of those biophotons. If we're going to consume light energy, those are the most light intense foods that we have. Plain and simple. Um, you know, so so this is why I'm so passionate about this stuff. And, and, and I know that there's a lot of different things we kind of covered today. And I know this is a bit different. Um, we're going to try to make it a little bit more applicable next week to a specific type of problem. Um, and we'll be talking about blood sugar imbalances, why fighting about carbs and, and fats and what causes what is, is I don't want to say secondary, but um, there are bigger things we need to consider. And fundamentally, it is a mitochondrial problem that we perceive as blood sugar rises, rate rises and falls. So we're going to get to that next week. It's going to be a lot of fun. Um, if you've been enjoying these lives, uh, I love to hear it. Um, you know, I, I do appreciate it. I find that this has been a lot of fun, you know, going through a lot of this stuff and sharing it. Um, so I hope you found it informative, truly, uh, because it, this is very different. I, I am sharing this information as I learn it. I know I could talk about detox and talk about herbs and what's for this and what's for that. But for me, 
having the concept and the philosophy is so much more important because you could figure out the details later. And if you truly are in the want to heal and, and be moving towards health, the fundamentals, the foundation, and the philosophy is step one. And this is not something you could learn in even like a an hour or a two hour, uh, you know, intake with say someone like me. As much as I could try to help, it, you you have to cut out a lot because there's only so much time you have. Which is why I love sharing so much information, you know, on these platforms. And I know it might seem all over the place. That's why the blog's there. So you know, a few action steps. You know, if you want to support me or you want to work with me, by all means, uh, that's certainly an option. Uh, you could check out my blog newsletter, InsideOutHealthWellness.com. Uh, there's a link. You could sign up for the newsletter. I got new blogs coming out every week. The new one's coming out tomorrow. That's on what we talked about today in more detail. There's more video. There's more pictures, etc. Uh, I just dropped my new book, which talks a lot about light and grounding. Uh, it's called How to Get World Class Sleep, which does exactly what it tells you. Um, it's all the stuff that I share with my patients, uh, etc., uh, you can find it. Link is in my bio. And then third, if you want to learn more about how to reverse high blood pressure naturally, I got a 10 minute free video uh, also on my profile. Um, and yeah, if you want to work with me, reach out. We can schedule a call, chat and, and, and really learn how to build these foundations into your life. So I hope you guys have a wonderful weekend. Um, yeah, have a good one.